have a word of prayer, then we'll get into the message. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. I pray that you bless tonight and bless the message, Lord. I pray for all that is said and done. Please be with those, Lord, are in urgent prayer this evening. I pray for that young man that uh, cut his fingers off, Lord. I pray for him. I just ask, Lord, that they'd be able to do some kind of surgery to be able to save them, Lord, if they can. Just uh, please just take care of that need. And again, bless this time. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, tonight I'm going to talk about uh, God's adoption process. God's adoption process. <clears throat> anybody know of anybody who's adopted? Know somebody who's adopted or somebody that's thinking about adopting? Uh, I don't know if we have anybody in here who adopted, but uh, I think it happens all the time. And people, I've met people say, I'd say, where are you from? Well, I'm from such and such. You know, are your parents still alive? Well, technically speaking, they're not my parents. They adopted me. I was adopted. You know, you meet, run into people like that. And it starts to get your wheels turning about, think about adoption. You say, well, somebody might say, yeah. And after they adopted me, my parents were able to have children. The doctor, told, this happens a lot. Doctor would tell somebody you can't have children. They go out and they adopt. And next thing you know, they have three or four kids. Uh, oftentimes that happens. And, you know, you hear that. And I've heard that before from people who've been adopted. And you start, maybe you know somebody and you think, okay, do the children that are naturally born by those parents have more rights than that of the adopted one? And the answer to it is no. Adoption takes care of everything. When it's done legally and right and all the papers are signed, the adopted child has the same rights as the natural born child. Now, I think about this. And if I say, well, in here, is anybody adopted? It's a, it's kind of like one of those questions where you're not wrong either way. If you say no, but if you joke and say, well, I was, my parents always told me you were adopted. My, my mother always did that to me. She always did that to me. She said I was from mom. If she's listening tonight, yeah, mom, I'm going to tell the story. Uh, Mount Fujiyama, she was over there in Japan. She made me cry. She made me cry when I was a kid. Yeah, imagine that. Your mother made you cry. You know. So, tell me, oh, oh, Kevin, sweetie, you're not really my child. You know, I, I, oh, little, little, little. My sisters can attest to this. My mother did it to me all the time. You're not really my child. We, we adopted you. We adopted you from your parents, and you're from Mount Fujiyama, Japan. I don't know why it was there, but anyway, you know, I was joking with the high songs on Sunday. It's all coming back in my face. Anyway, uh, I'm the one that's from Japan, according to my mother. But she'd tell me the story, and then my face, you know, would get all contorted, and I'd start crying, and my sisters, they never consoled me. But, <clears throat> you know, they enjoyed it. They enjoyed it when she began to tell the story. And my mother would repeat that to me after a while. You know, you start believing it. <clears throat> but if I was adopted legally, I would have the same rights as my sisters. Now, all of us in here tonight that know the Lord as your Savior. Now, this is the key. There are two births. And we say this all the time. Born once, you die twice. Now, process that. If you're born once, you're going to die twice. You say, how is that possible? When I'm dead, that's it. Is it? Well, think about this. If you're only born once, and I was born February 7th, 1965, that's when I was born the first time. All the way to 1976, 11 years, and on September 21st, at a service in Aliquippa, I heard a man preaching. Billy Randall, by name, who's with the Lord, he died. He was in a car accident. And went, he was killed instantly and went immediately to heaven. But as he was preaching, and he was a type, when he preached, his face got as red as a tomato. And his veins stuck out. He, sweat poured off of his head, and his hair got all frizzy. And he'd just get as red as you could imagine. as his preach. And he got so into his sermons. And, and Rose and Pete know him full well, and those that have heard him. And he was preaching one evening and he was getting all fired up and he was preaching on hell. 
and I was in the back of the church. If you look at the church, I was over on this side, about third pew from the back. And that night, God really began to deal with my heart. And I didn't hear a voice, but I heard something in my head tell me, you don't get saved tonight. You're going to go to hell. And I thought, wow. Wow. And conviction began to get all over me. And I get the I got the white knuckle on the pew during the invitation. And I held on. And I held on. I wouldn't let go. And the Holy Spirit said, go forward. Go forward. Tonight, get saved. And I wrestled. I had a wrestling match with the Lord. But that night I let go. I let go. I walked down the aisle and I got to the I got to the altar. And the preacher said to me, what are you here for? And I said, I want to get saved. And he said to me, he said, I thought you were saved. And I said, I didn't fully understand everything. But I know tonight I need to be saved. And of all people, he got my dad. And he said, your son's up there. And my dad come up and he said, what did you come up for? I said, because dad, I don't think I'm saved. I said, he said, but you prayed. I said, I know I prayed. I, I didn't fully get it. I was young. I was little. I didn't fully get it. I got it now. I got it. I need to be saved. And I prayed that night and I got saved. And I got what is called born again. You know, the Bible says specifically in John 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So born once, you're going to die twice. You're going to die physically, and you're going to die spiritually in hell for all eternity. That's as, as honest as I can be. But if you're born twice, here's the beauty. As I was born again that night, I was born again by the Spirit of God. If you're born twice, you're only going to die once. Can I have an amen? amen. Now, none of us want to die physically, but we know that the transition, and I've seen it many times being a healthcare professional. I've seen the transition of death and I've seen people actually go through it right before my eyes. I witnessed it many times and I watched somebody take their last breath. I've seen it more than I can count. You know, being in a medical field for almost 40 years, you see a lot, but you see death. That's only temporal and only short lasting for the most part, the pass from life to death. But for a Christian, it's only the beginning of a new life die once, you live again. But for an unsaved person who doesn't know Christ as their Savior, they've never been taken into the fold of the family of God. And this is the beauty of adoption. And when I say this tonight, everybody that's saved in this room or hearing me on Zoom or going to listen to this message in the future, if you have accepted Christ as your Savior tonight, you have been adopted by Him. Okay? You've been adopted into the family of God. And I'm going to prove it from the Bible. Now, when you think about adoption rights, and I said this, I'm going to read a, pa uh, a paragraph to you, and then we'll go to some scripture. Adoption rights are the same as birth children. Okay, so if my wife and I saw a baby and it needed a home, and I told Brittany and Nadine, and I said, we're going to adopt this child. And I adopted that child. That child would become my child. And that child would have the same rights as Brittany and Nadine would have. The same as birth children. One of the best features of adoption is that adopted children have the same rights as biological children in every other family. Okay? All children have the right to receive emotional and financial support from both parents. And adopted children are no different. Adopted Adoptive parents have the legal responsibility to provide care and financial support until the child reaches the age of majority in the state where the family lives, and that's usually at 18, or until the child is emancipated, until they go off on their own. Additionally, the law treats adopted children and biological children the same for the purpose of probate administration if a child's parent dies, okay? For example, if the parent dies without a will, the court will determine each child's share of any estate 
left by the parents by usually the state's probate formula. The court will include adopted children in the calculation and will award them the same percentage that biological children would inherit. That's the laws of our land, which means if there are three kids, two of them are natural birth, one's adopted, and those parents die without a will, the state takes into account all three kids and treats them equally, which means if there's $300,000 there, child one gets 100000 child two gets 100000 and the third child, if it's adopted, gets $100,000. The laws of the land protect the adopted child. Is it any different with God? No, it is not. Who's God's son? Who's his only begotten son? Okay, the Bible says, John 3, 16. We should all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, now that's the King James Bible. The new Bible say his one and only son, which that's not true. The King James Bible says only begotten son because the only begotten son of God is Jesus Christ. Was he not begotten at Calvary? So tonight, everybody who's saved, are you a child of God? Are you? Turn to John 1, 12. John 1, 12. John chapter 1 and verse 12. Or Bethlehem, I'm sorry. At Bethlehem, not Calvary. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. For those on Zoom, I wanted to see if everybody was paying attention. Right. <clears throat> you know why I said that? Because my phone's going off. <clears throat> I'm telling you, my phone... Oh, anyway, let's not get into the phones. <clears throat> John chapter 1 and verse number 12. Okay. Now, how do you become a child of God? And how do you get adopted by God? You say, well, that's a big task. God's going to adopt you? What's he going to do? Sign a piece of paper and say, Kevin Dragonak is my son? And you're going to take that over to the courthouse and turn that in and say, God signed this and I'm a son of God. <laughs> what would they do? <laughs> you know, they'd look and say, yeah, this guy's a nut. This guy's crazy. But as the scripture says, and we'll get right to the very word adopted. And I had this in my reading last night. This is what kind of sparked this on. This message I had prepared for a while, and I just hadn't preached it. Uh, so I said, you know, as I was reading last night, adoption. Well, what a great thing. You know, and how many people have had a great life being adopted and have had parents that love them and, you know, have, have been there for them in every account to say, we're going to take care of you, not only physically, we're going to feed you, we're going to support you, we're going to send you to school, we're going to protect you. We're going to be your parents for you. What a beautiful thing, isn't it? And how many people and have talked about the beauty of, boy, I was adopted. And those parents, they were like my real parents to me. And some say, well, I never met my parents. But what does God do? When you come to him, and this is the beauty of salvation. When you come to him with childlike faith and you say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my savior. Don't you get such wonderful things? For one, you get salvation. And that's such peace to know. And the night I got saved, what peace came into my heart? Beautiful peace. Boy, after I prayed and after I got saved, when I went home that night, I just, I was just like, wow, that really took. That really took. I know if I die, I'm going to heaven. Christ is my savior. All right, John chapter one. I became on that night. It says in verse 12, but as many as received him. So what did I do on September 11th, 1976? I received Jesus. I prayed, believed on him, and he became my savior. But as many as received him, to them gave he power. So what power did he give me that night? To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And I believed on the name of Christ. And I got eternal life. I became a son of God. Verse 13, which were born, not of blood. So I wasn't naturally born, was I? Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. It wasn't two people coming together that had me. No. Nor of the will of man. It wasn't a man and a woman consenting to it. 
No, I wasn't born that way the second time. How was I born? And if you're saved in here tonight, how were you born the second time? You were born spiritually of God. You were born of God. Okay. And as I said, Christ is the only begotten son of God. He was begotten at Calvary. Or I keep saying it. He's begotten at Bethlehem. He was begotten at Bethlehem by Mary and through the Holy Ghost. She had a baby. And we're going to celebrate that here in a few weeks, couple weeks. There, she was great with child. And she brought forth her son and laid him in a manger and all celebrated. And then came the Magi who brought their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and laid them down there and presented those gifts to him, the son of God. But he wasn't the only son of God. We are sons of God by the power of the Holy Ghost. And it's through the birth the spiritual birth that we received, okay? And, and that, and here, here's the great thing about it is, it's open to everybody. Tonight, we don't have a corner on the market. Anybody, anybody could at any time have the same thing we have. All they have to do is come to Christ. And they'll get all of this that I'm about to talk about. Let's go, so what is the payment? What's the payment? With adoption, isn't there a payment? Okay, let's say my wife and I want to adopt this baby. We can't do it without what? You got to have some fees. You got to make the payment to the powers that be to legally do this. So, for me to get into the family of God, was there a payment? You say, oh, come on, Pastor. You mean God took out his wallet? And he said to the judge over there, I'll pay for him. How much did I cost? How much did you cost? Oh, we're saying a lot. What, what's a lot? Uh, a million? Did God put up that? I got it right here. What was the cost of our adoption? It was, this is beautiful. The cost of our adoption was the death of his only begotten son. Wow, when you think about that. We're adopted in the family of God and we're sons, of, sons and daughters of God. That makes us Brothers and sisters of who? Christ. So let's let's digest this. Our brother died for us. Got it? What was the price? His death but something in him, his blood, his blood. That's why the blood of Christ has power to redeem. It's redemption. It's got a price. You know, when a mafia wants to take somebody out, they pay, right? They pay the hitman. I'll get, and it's blood money, isn't it? Pay. Take him out and I'll pay you. Judas Iscariot went to the priests and he said, what will you give me? What will you give me? And I'll deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him, what? 30 pieces of silver. Here you go. And what did he do with that afterward? Of course, after it was done and he said, I'd be, I've sinned. And then I betrayed the innocent blood. He went to the same people that he thought were his friends. I've sinned. I've sinned. I betrayed the innocent blood. What is that to us? <laughs> See, out of that, what's that to us? You did it. What did he do with that blood money? 
threw it down in the temple, didn't he? Clang, 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 clang. Ran out and he hanged himself. What did they do with the money? They bought a seldoma, a field to bury strangers in. And that field was called what? The field of blood. The field of blood. Our adoption cost God something. It cost God the death of his only begotten son. That's how much God loved us, that he would send his son down to bleed and die so that we could have the opportunity to go to heaven. And I'll tell you this right now. You can't work your way through those pearly gates. You can't get in any other way than through the way that God established. He sent his son to die, to bleed and to die for the sins of the human race. And there's not a person on earth that's going to get to heaven and going to tell God, open those gates because I deserve to get in. Not one person. And there's not another anybody on the face of this planet that's going to get through any other way than through the blood of Christ. And if you think you can, you're a fool. There's one sacrifice that God honors, and that was the death of his son. Did not John the Baptist look at Jesus and say, behold, the lamb of God? You see that lamb right there? What's coming out of that lamb? That lamb's dead on that wall there, that picture. There's blood all over that lamb. That lamb is dead. But you can see when looking at the lamb, what's up behind it? Three crosses up on that hill. And it pictures the blood of the one in the middle. The lamb is the sacrifice. And anybody that comes and accepts the sacrifice of Jesus Christ gets their sins washed away. How great is that? and gets legally adopted into the family of God. It's like all the paperwork stood before God, and when you accepted him as your Savior, the whole thing was written there. And the Lord took and he signed the paperwork and said, I legally adopt this person. I was adopted spiritually on September 21st, 1976. Let's go over to... The payment, the payment. Let's go Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Let's turn a little bit of scripture. Let's go Second Corinthians and First Corinthians. We'll go both books. Okay, let's look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and look in verse number 20. Okay, we'll just go to 1 Corinthians. We're not going to go to 2. It says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number 19. Let's look in verse 18. This was part of my scripture reading just a couple days ago. The Bible says here, flee fornication. Two words. It's very hard for people nowadays. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Now, why is it important for a Christian not to commit fornication? Why is it important for a Christian to stay away from sin as much as they can? Why is that important? Because our bodies are not our own anymore. You see, when we come to Christ, we give up certain rights. An unsaved person, the Lord lets them do what they want to do. And oftentimes, they'll get into drugs or they'll get to sinning and do things. And, and you say, well, how come they get away with that stuff? Well, because they don't know the Lord. And the Lord didn't adopt them. But the father of an adopted child, won't they provide discipline as well? Now you say, well, they'll give and they'll support and they'll protect. But yet, 
when you're raising a child, what's important to keep them away from trouble? Oftentimes, what do you have to do with your kids? You have to discipline them. You just don't allow your children to do everything they want to do, do, do you? What do you produce? Well, when you say yes all the time, you say, well, I love them. And that's why I let them do whatever they want to do. And I never tell them no, because I love them so much. Do you really love them when you won't say no? Isn't it good sometimes for a child to hear no? Don't they understand, oh, my, my parent really loves me because they told me no. They don't always understand that when they're younger, but more when they get older, they get it. And oftentimes you telling them no and you disciplining them for bad behavior will keep them out of trouble later on. So isn't it, isn't it God's responsibility to judge us and to discipline us when we get away from the things that we should be doing? Absolutely. Because when we get saved and we come to the Lord, we give our possession of ourselves over to him. And now he possesses us. He owns us. As the Bible says, he actually bought us. Okay. It says in verse 19, what? Or let's read 18 again. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Which is what? In you. So who lives in you? Who's the Holy Ghost? Isn't it Father, Son, Holy Ghost? So when you get saved, who lives in you? God does. God lives in you. That's why when a Christian sins, all of a sudden inside, they can't, can't be happy with it. You say, well, I used to sin and I used to enjoy it. Now when I get saved, I sin and I don't enjoy it anymore. I do for a second, then all of a sudden I feel like, well, what did I do? Right? And you say, that wasn't fun. It was fun for a second, but now it's not fun anymore. Because you know God's looking at you, right? And God's inside, and he says, you shouldn't have done that. And sometimes he'll let you go for a couple of days like that and make you feel a little bit funny inside and a little bit awkward and a little bit like dirty. And you say, I don't like this feeling anymore. Well, don't do that again. And maybe God will bring something into your life to discipline you and to judge you for it. And you say, oh, Lord, this, is, this punishment's tough. Well, don't do it again. Isn't that what your parent did? Isn't it any different than God? Are we not adopted into the family of God? The Bible says to endure the chastening hand of the Lord. Listen, when you're saved, it's totally different, different ballgame. Before you're saved, God's distant. But when you're saved, now he's your father. And God looks at us a whole lot different than he does the world. And he expects a whole lot more of us. Let's keep reading. I'm not making this up. This is what the scripture says. The Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God. We got it from God. And ye are not your own. Why aren't we our own? Remember what bought us? For ye are bought with a price. That price was the death of Christ, the blood that he shed. Ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose? God's. We're gods. And with that, we ought to say, praise the Lord. I'm glad I belong to the family of God. Really, when I pass away from this world, I'm going to be with my father. And you can boldly say that if you're saved in here tonight. When you pass from this earth, you know you're going to be with your father. And they might say, where's your father live? He lives where? He lives in heaven. He lives in heaven. We have that assurance here on earth that we are going to heaven because Christ died for us and because we're saved. So, payment. Spiritually, we're adopted. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> okay, Ephesians chapter 1. And I want you to get Galatians 4. And Galatians 4 is where I was reading last night. Physical adoption or spiritual adoption. Okay. Spiritual adoption. <clears throat> We're spiritual children of the Lord. 
Now that doesn't take me physically out of the ranks of being my dad's child, but spiritually something changed inside. My spiritual man inside became God's and I became part of his family spiritually. Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians one and verse five, it says, having predestinated us unto the adoption, there's the word, of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Okay, turn to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4. And let's look in verse number, <clears throat> number 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman made under the law. That's Jesus Christ, okay? To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive, there it is, the adoption of sons, okay? So the death of Christ, the redemption and power of his blood gave us the power to become adopted sons of God. And it says in verse six, and because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, Abba simply means Father. And I'll put it this way. You know you're saved because when trouble comes into your life, where do your eyes automatically go? You see, an unsaved person, when trouble comes into their life, they may pick other venues. They might go to the bottle. They might go to the drug. They might go to the counselor. They might go to the prostitute. They might go somewhere to try to get comfort. But a child of God, where do their eyes go? What happens when trouble comes in our hearts? We automatically look up and we cry. Father, Father, help me. Don't we? If I preached it to the world, they wouldn't get that. They would be like, they don't have that connection. But something within your heart, because you know you're saved, within your heart cries out first, God, help me. Right? That's how you know you're saved. Cry out to God. Eyes automatically, God, my Father, help me. We can truly pray. Our Father, which art in heaven. Right? Because he truly is. See, we just don't know him. We are known of him. Spiritually, we were bought the blood of Christ. We are spiritual sons. Here's the question. Will we be physical son? You say, well, Pastor, how's that going to happen? I mean, here I am. I'm a physical son of Jim Dragonac. How can I become a physical son of God? There's a day coming. And I've been talking about this. I've been talking about it a lot. Christ is going to come to the clouds and he's going to say, come up hither. And at the rapture, it's called the rapture. And tonight, if it would happen, and it could, it can happen anytime the Lord decides it's time for me to come. I'm stepping off my throne, and I'm going to those clouds. And when I get there, I'm going to yell, come up hither. And everybody who is saved is going to hear the sound. And you know what's going to happen? Our physical bodies are going to be adopted. We're going to leave this old one behind. Actually, at death you would. But at the rapture, it's going. It's going. And it's going to miraculously be changed. And it's going to put, the Bible says, it's going to, it's corruptible. It's going to put on what? Incorruption. It's immortal. It's going to put on immortality. So that we will never die. And the Bible says we shall be changed. In a moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye. Adopted. To have a body like his. <laughs> to have a mind like his. That's not a fairy tale. The world might say, oh, you, you Christians, you're nuts. That's a fairy tale. Come on, you believe that Christ is going to call you out of here? What's the Bible say? And not like other people, we don't believe this book is a book written by man. We hold it as a book written by God with specific promises. And I'll tell you this, regardless of what the world tells you, you do what this book says and you'll be a winner. And on the other side of eternity, you'll come out better than you are here. This book has the words of eternal life. This book has the words that one day when we get to heaven, we're going to look back. And one thing we're going to say, we're going to say, Lord, I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for the book you gave me. That book changed my life. And when people believe this book, it changes their life. Now, not only are we got, we were bought with blood, we're spiritually adopted, physically adopted. So, what's the last thing I want to talk about? I'm going to talk about what do we get? <laughs> Doesn't everybody like to know, hey, do I got an inheritance? If your parents say, hey, you know, if something would happen, did you ever hear this from your parents? Hey, if something would happen to me, you'd be rich. <laughs> your dad ever get you aside and say, son, daughter, come here. You know, I love you guys. And I've done everything in my life. I've worked hard. You see these fingers? I worked them to the bone for you. I sweat and I toiled and I labored. And one thing I want you to know, if anything would have happened to me, and I was to die, and your mother was to go, we have left you with a lot. <laughs> you are going to be some rich kids. And what would they do? We don't want that, Dad. We loved you enough, and your love was enough. Would they turn it away? So let me ask this. Who's the richest being you know? Come on. Who owns the cattle on a thousand hills? That's a pretty rich guy. Aren't, aren't the streets of heaven made of gold? And I'm not talking about just gold. I got a wedding ring here. It's about the only gold I have. What am I? I can't see through it. If I look at Bill there, I, I see gold. Amen, bro. Amen. Amen. That's good. Bill's gold. Bill's gold but I can't see through it. But the streets of heaven are so pure, you can see through them. Now, who owns all of heaven? Okay, so let's put two and two together here. We went over the legal things of adoption. So that means, aren't we winners? When you think, oh, I got all this because I accepted Christ as my Savior? Yeah, boy, you wait and see what you're going to get. You wait and see. I'll tell you, if you're not saved in here tonight, if you're not saved listening to this, first thing I would do is I would put my head down and I would say, Lord, I want to be saved. Just not for the benefit, though. I want to be saved for the peace that comes with it. I want to be saved for the comfort. I want to be saved for the assurance. Of knowing that if I were to die, I'm going to heaven. I want to be saved, Lord. I want to be your child. But when it's all said and done, everything that God has, he has promised to his kids. Grab a hold of that. What does God own? 
he says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. He puts his feet out like an ottoman on the earth. Kicks his shoes off and his feet like on an ottoman, the earth as he sits on his throne. He owns it all. And he says, come to me, accept me as your savior and you get it all. Rights of adoption, protection, and the other P, providence. We'll close with this. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter one. I think I want maybe one more verse, and that was in Galatians. Just let me look real quickly. Go to first Peter chapter one and no, let's just go to first Peter chapter one. We'll just go there. Okay. First Peter chapter one, it says in verse number four. Uh, verse three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. Who doesn't want an inheritance? Everybody does to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. See, even if you get an inheritance here, it's corruptible. Thieves can break through and steal it. You know, it can go away. You could spend it and squander it all to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. For who? For you. The Lord reserves it up there. You ever hear the federal reserves? The federal reserves. That's the banking system. They're reserves. There's money in those banks to cover the debts of America, we think. <laughs> At least there used to be. There's gold in Fort Knox to cover everybody. At least we used to think there was. Nobody's ever really seen that gold or know it's, well, there's gold in Fort Knox. You don't know that. Somebody's got it. But in heaven, it's reserved. I'll tell you what. Bible says where thieves do not break through nor steal. It will not be squandered. Your social security down here is up there. You'll be socially secured. You have an inter inheritance. And again, that's free. Now, it's not for everybody. Because I've heard people say this. We're all the children of God. How many times have you heard people or even preachers say, everybody's a child of God? Well, that's, that's someone who's false. A true preacher would say what the scripture said. We are all the children of God. What would the true preacher say? By faith in Christ Jesus. You want to be a child of God, you got to put your faith in Christ Jesus. And I'll tell you what happens. And I've been down the road so many times with people that think, should I get saved? And I've dealt one-on-one -on -one with many people. And I preached many sermons. And I have brought a person almost all the way to the cross. Showed them he died for you. See that Savior there? That Savior, he died for you. And took him off that cross. They buried him. Three days later, that same Savior came out of the grave. And that same Savior lives in heaven. He did all that for you. And I've walked them spiritually by the hand, taken them all the way. And I say, will you trust him as your Savior? Will you accept him into your heart as your Savior? And I have had people, I remember one person down in Pensacola, Florida, 
in particular. I'll never forget his face, never forget his name. His name was Cliff. We knocked on his door. We witnessed to him. And he had sweat running down off of his face. And there at his door, Cliff had to make a decision. And I asked Cliff, Cliff, will you pray with me? And will you accept Jesus as your Savior? Ah, the conviction on that man. And I've seen the conviction so many times on so many people. And some have said to me, no. No. I'm not ready. No. And others I've said, will you take my hand? And will you pray with me? And will you ask Jesus Christ tonight to be your Savior? And someone reached their hand out, grabbed the hold of my hand and said, yes, I want to be saved. Everybody's got to make their own decision. And tonight, whether you're listening on there, whether you're listening in the future, or whether you're listening right now, you got to make your decision. What will you do with Jesus Christ? For those that have accepted him, what has he done for you? And go back to that day. And maybe you were one of those ones that was hedging. You were hedging. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Should I? Shouldn't I? What will my friends say? What will my parents say? What will my kids say? What will, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Should I? Shouldn't I? Maybe you were one of them. I was white knuckled. I didn't know what to do. The Holy Spirit kept go, go, go. I went. Am I better for it? You better believe it. If I would have held on, yeah, maybe I could have got drunk with my friends and maybe I could have partied with them and maybe enjoyed it more. And the sins, I could have had a good time. With the cost of going to hell? I'll take heaven. I'll take heaven. And tonight, you have a choice. Will you accept Christ? You say, yes, I will. I will. I'll do it. What do I have to do? You have to ask. If the Lord's been dealing with you and you want to be saved, and you want him to fill that empty cavity, you can ask him, Lord, by faith tonight, I want to be saved. And all you got to do is you got to pray from your heart and mean it. And you could pray this. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around. If you want to pray this, you can pray it right here. Privacy of your seat or in the privacy of Zoom tonight or wherever you're listening, you could pray this prayer. You could mean it. Lord, tonight, I'm sorry for my sins. Lord, I believe you died for me and I believe you were buried and you rose again from the dead. Tonight, Lord Jesus, right now, I ask you, please come into my heart. Please forgive me of all my sins. Please save my soul. Be my personal Lord and my personal Savior. Take me to heaven when I die, Lord. I love you. And I thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. In your precious name I pray. Amen. And if you mean that, then he saved you. And... Guess what he did? He signed the paperwork. <laughs> and it's legal. You were legally adopted into the family of God. Not only that, but he also wrote your name down in heaven. In the Lamb's book of life, tonight, a sinner, if they prayed and accepted Christ, their name went into the book of life. And one thing that's great, and I'm done. There's no erasers on God's pen pencils. <laughs>
<clears throat> let's go to 